Almost 20 minutes before 8, Rona Barrett having the week off. One man has been the MC or panelist on more quiz shows than anyone else in television, and that is Bill Cullen. Bill is most identified with The Price is Right and I've Got a Secret, but along the way in his long career, he's done Name That Tune, Place the Face, Bank on the Stars, and Down You Go. Bill has seen the quiz show format change from simple, uncomplicated games with Spartan sets and small prizes to shows that employ big production and a appeal more to greed than to game playing. Out in California, Bill compared the quiz shows of the past to the ones being done today. Well, I guess, I guess if you had to take one difference, it's a difference of fun and spontaneity. In the old days, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the set for a quiz show consisted of a, of a gray velvet or velour drape a little stand to hold the, the master of ceremonies copy on questions in little cards and two microphones before which the contestants stood and that was about the entire set i guess in those days might have cost even considering company prices three or four hundred dollars today uh i just finished a pilot at nbc and the, the set price the price for building the set alone for a simple game show that really doesn't require anything but a gray velour and a couple of microphones before which the contestants stand that's all really required the set price alone was i figure about one hundred and sixty five thousand dollars so it seems as television progresses and i put quotes around progresses it seems as television progresses the importance gets to be the set the total the total cost of the thing and the people uh, uh, the people who really are your show have been pushed into the background I, as a matter of fact i've seen game shows with sets so terribly elaborate and expensive that when you tune in you have to peer through the set and look around and you say oh yeah there they are there's the contestant and here hiding under that the large umbrella or whatever it is there's the mc so i think too much attention is being paid to sets and and they call it environment now well, with environment in mind, we asked Bill to speculate about what the game show of the future might be like. By golly, that's a great question. And if I knew the answer to that, I doubt if I'd tell you right now, because I'd get in the packaging business. I'd, I'd run one up and move over to a, any network, go to any network and say, here's the game show of the future. I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that the game show of the future is going to be pretty much the same as today's game shows as far as content. There are only so many questions or, or challenges or, or tasks you can give your contestants. That'll be for the money. I think the MCs will all be younger and handsomer, much to my dismay. But I think the prizes will get out of hand. I, I have a feeling that, that the sets will be elaborate. The winners will perhaps be given totally tax-free rich man's lives for their and their next generation's heirs. I think the losers will be probably put to death or something commensurate with, with winners. I mean, I have a feeling that the, the next, the future game show, if nothing else, is going to perhaps make a lot of people rich and bring this world of ours to an end. <laughs> Bill is wrong about one thing. Whatever the game show of the future, it's sure to be emceed by Bill Cullen.
you got speed on tape? Speed. Okay. Bill, uh, years ago we had quiz shows with uh, very simple sets and not much in way of prizes. Today we've got big game shows. What's the difference today? Well, I guess, I guess if you had to take one difference, it's a difference of fun and spontaneity. In the old days, as you mentioned, uh, the set for a quiz show consisted of a, of a gray velvet or velour drape, a little stand to hold the, the master of ceremonies copy on questions in little cards, and two microphones before which the contestants stood. And that was about the entire set, I guess, in those days might have cost, even considering company prices, three or four hundred dollars. Today, uh, I just finished a pilot at NBC, and the, the set price, the price for building the set alone for a simple game show that really doesn't require anything but a gray velour and a couple of microphones before which the contestants stand, that's all really required. The set price alone was, I figure, about $165,000. So it seems as television progresses, and I put quotes around progresses, it seems as television progresses, the importance gets to be the set, the total, the total cost of the thing, and the people. Uh, uh, the people who really are your show have been pushed into the background. I, as a matter of fact, I've seen game shows with sets so terribly elaborate and expensive that when you tune in, you have to peer through the set and look around and say, oh yeah, there they are, there's the contestant, and here hiding under that uh, large umbrella or whatever it is, there's the MC. So I think too much attention is being paid to sets, and, and they call it environment now. So you think we've lost some of the fun that we used to have? Fun indeed, and, and importance of the word. Uh, news, for instance, now, they have a fellow who gets credit for creating the news studio environment. That m simply means, in the case of New York, uh, Radio City, about a $2 million studio in, in which, from which these words originate. I think too much attention is being paid on the buildings, on the lightings, on the special effects, and uh, various members of the union who are listening to this who have to do with that, my apologies. But I, I think it could better be spent in, in human beings, in, in playing a little bit more with people. What about the prizes? Are, are we, are we <laughs> too much greed into the show? Yeah, well, I don't know if you want to call it greed, but we're certainly giving away a lot more. First show I ever did was in 1946 with Mark Goodson and Bill Todman. And uh, we went on the air like at 3 o'clock in the basement of the studio building in New York, and their office was on the fourth floor. At about half an hour before airtime, Bill Todman would pick up the prizes, which consisted of like 20 pots and pans, uh, mix master, as they called him in those days, a couple of other kitchen implements, and he'd come down the elevator. And that was the entire prize package. That was the budget for that show. He'd come down the elevator, walk in, we'd set him around, and there we'd go to work in front of our gray velvet and our couple of microphones and have a ball. Matter of fact, once when Bill was getting off the elevator, when Bill was getting off the elevator to bring the prizes into the show, someone bumped him and he dropped all these pots and pans, and Goodman Ace a humorist of note who did Easy Aces and so many other marvelous programs and does columns today. Uh, Goodman was never at a loss for words, so when all the pans clattered around the elevator floor, Goodman Ace looked at Bill Todman and said, Bill, you drop your script. And that's the, that's the way it was then as far as, as the importance of prizes. We had a lot of fun in those days. We were live, and being live was fun because you knew when you went on, you had, to, you had to get it off. I mean, you didn't stop for anything. As you probably know, I'm not stopping in the middle of this answer. But you didn't stop. You kept going until you brought it to a logical conclusion, until someone said, cut. And if you see a cut, oh, cut? All right. And that's my answer to you, Pat. Are you bringing a shot? I'm going in and out a little bit, okay. depending on the stage. So they can. <coughs> oh, I'm not doing it for, for, the, uh, for that reason. Uh, we're talking about the fun things that happen uh, on the shows. Uh, you said something about uh, somebody bumping into a Rolls Royce with a camera. Yeah, they're very... <laughs> In the very early days of Price is Right, we knocked ourselves out to give fabulously big, and for that time, impossible prizes for anyone to attain any other way. One of the things we gave away was a Rolls Royce. Uh, it must have cost then, I'm guessing, $30,000, which was an awful lot of uh, automobile, uh, an awful lot of money for an automobile. And one of our cameramen, I remember him well, his name was Ronnie, <laughs> and I hope he's watching right now. One of our cameramen, cameras were on pedestals that moved then. And Ronnie had to move into position. We were on the air, and they said, okay, Ronnie, get your camera in for a close-up of the Rolls Royce. He was about 6'6 six, six and weighed 240, so he wheeled this big camera around, a great big color camera, got it heading in the right direction, didn't stop it, went smack into the side of the Rolls Royce, and did about $8,000 worth of damage. We didn't stop. We weren't on tape. We kept going, and everybody enjoyed it tremendously, especially the Rolls Royce dealer. 
who, you know, made the $8,000 for repairing. But it was fun. It got talked about. It got written about. And I assure you, the show didn't suffer from it. Of all the shows you've done, and you've done a lot of them, what are your warmest memories? Uh, gee, I have done a lot of shows, and I have so many warm memories. I don't want to just make one, because if I make one, I know I'll, I'll neglect some of the others. Certainly, wait, I've got to see... Wait, 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 wait. Something's happening with the picture. Though. Clouds. Clouds. Mm -hmm. If you want, I can touch on a pawn in this, and it can be something they can cut. Uh, of all the shows you've done, Bill, of all the shows you've done, Bill, and you've done a lot of, do you have any really super warm memories? Yeah, I have a great many memories, and rather than just say one, and thereby eliminate all the others undeservedly, I'll say, I have great memories about I've Got a Secret, because it and Gary Moore and that marvelous panel of ours, uh, we just had, had a ball for 13 years. Every Wednesday night, we'd go in there, and we'd all make a lot of money playing a game, and we all had a lot of fun. So I've Got a Secret is one. Price is right. The, the original Price is right. I have to say I have very warm memories about that, because it made a lot of us quite well to do, just with the income from that show. So your memories about that has to be well. I did a show on ABC Radio called Quick as a Flash that you may or may not remember. Many people probably have never heard of it. I assume someone there does remember it. It was a sensational show, a very warm memory I have for that. And in addition to that, I, I remember warmly a lot of my radio programs, the thing I did for in the early morning in New York for six years, where I did a wake-up show from six to 10. The reason those memories are warm about those shows are those shows were successes. They were fun. Everybody loved you. And as a consequence, you loved everybody else. And you, you were sort of riding the crest and staying up there even a short time. That makes a warm memory. So in that sense, I have another memory I have. A, let me interject this. In the old days, you'd be working live in a studio, and they'd be remodeling the studio upstairs and pounding on the floor there or your ceiling, and the noise would come through, and you'd keep working. Now, strangely enough, to make me feel at home, they've done the same thing today. Here we are sitting in our backyard, as it were, and next door they're building a swimming pool. Wealthy people over there. But they're doing a swimming pool, and we're hearing the noise. And because this is live, <laughs> it is live. And anyway, we are continuing, and that's the way it was. You live with the noise. You talk over. There's an airplane. Would you get him shoot the airplane down and strike the fellows over there? But I hope that answers your question, <laughs> more or less. Would you expand a little bit on that? Uh, you were talking about uh, how much fun it was to do those shows. What was fun about it? Well, the, the fun, if you have a show that's going well, uh, any show to really be a fun memory should go very well or very badly. If it's, a, if it's a shambles, you can look back and have very warm memories about that. And I've had shambles, too. But because I've had shambles and some successes, I prefer to remember the successes. The thing that's fun about him is every guy on that show, everyone, would come in saying, hey, this show is hot. Everybody knows about it. People are watching it in television and or listening to it in radio. And consequently, today we're going to accomplish something. So everyone would come in with a, with a great attitude of gung-ho, pardon the expression. But let's go, let's get this thing on the air and do the best we can. And because it was one show, you, you would go, you have 26 minutes, for instance, to get that day's work in. At the end of 26 minutes, you'd sort of mentally collapse or emotionally it was over until the next day. Now you go in to a studio at 11 in the morning, you're going to be there till say 6 or 7 at night, and you, pardon the expression, but it's accurate, grind out five shows, in some cases six shows, in rare cases two or three, but you're never quite finished. You always say, okay, that's the end of this one, but I have 15 minutes to change my tie-in jacket, and I've got to come back and do another one. So you're not getting, in other words, you're concentrating your energy over five shows, which dilutes it that much, as opposed to throwing everything you have into one program, you on Good Morning America have that advantage. You're there live. What you do today is going to be dead from that. You, you start and you work until the end of the time, and that's today. You know you're going to have to come back tomorrow. I assure you, if all of us participating at this moment knew that when we finished this period, it would have take 15 minutes to change clothes, come back and do another one for three more times or four more times during the day, we wouldn't be having so much fun. I'd be conserving my energy right now. I'd step into the pool or something like that. But because it's one show, I'm giving all I have, which isn't all that much. You mentioned a lot of the great shows you've done. What about Name That Tune? Name That Tune was one of the shows I've done I wouldn't consider a great show. 
It is great now because it's done by Tom Kennedy, who's a good friend of mine and does one sensational job. When I did it, it was sickening. And uh, I'm, glad you brought that, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we had a fellow who, who owned the show. His name was Harry Salter. And Harry was unusual. And someone would miss a question and thereby lose a chance at $800 or $1,000. And I'd say to him, gee, Miss McGillicuddy, I'm sorry about that. And at the end of the show, Harry would come up to me and say, don't say you're sorry. It takes the bloom off the rose. I'd say, well, they just, won a th they just lost $1,000, and I am legitimately sorry. And unless I can say I'm sorry, you've got to get someone else to do the show. Well, that went on 39 weeks, I think. And finally, he got the drift, and he got someone else to do the show. But, <laughs> but I must say, Name That Tune is one of the great shows I didn't do. Not one of your fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it, it shot a lot of us down through the years. And I'm very happy that Tom Kennedy is doing, and, and Ralph Edwards, who, by the way, has taken over production. Harry Salter sits in the wings and collects money, and I hope not much. But anyway, anyway, right now, name that tune is certainly a fine show. <laughs> this is uh, one of these uh, 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 <coughs> kind of questions everybody always asks, but I, I would like to get your particular response to it. What would somebody from Mars think, you know, when they predict this is going to happen next year? They're going to come down in their flying saucer, and they what? And, you know, down in Hollywood, then they, they, they drop in on a studio, and they see one of these games. I think, I think they think it cost us $80 billion and has taken us 3,000 light years to get here. Let's spend another $80 billion and 3,000 more light years and get the heck out. I, I think it would be. Can you imagine walking without having any idea into one of these studios and the guy says, you sit here and I'll take your ticket and you might be a contestant. When I say applaud, boy, you applaud. And when a guy up there says laugh, you laugh. And meantime, all the action has taken place on stage that these poor Martians are trying to see. Invariably, the important part of the action is hidden behind some camera or beside some set or some scorekeeper or a production assistant running in to undo a mistake that was made the last time when the Venetians were here. But I, I think the whole thing of looking in this little box all day, and I do a great deal of it, I think all of us are missing out on something. I made a lot of money out of that little box, and I intend to make some more. And as long as the people from Mars or anywhere else want to look into it, and, and watch what we're doing and buy the stuff we hold up and smile at them about. That's fine with me, but I really, frankly, think there must be a better way of spending our time and our money. And I guess I took care of the rest of my career, which fortunately <laughs> is fairly short. <laughs> not anything. I, it's not doing out well anyway, so what do I care? <laughs> if you've got, got a story for us, uh, to, to tell us something about what it was like to do a game show in the old days. Well, the fun, the fun thing about doing a game show in the old days, again, I, come, I hearken back to the first game show I ever did, which was called Winner Take All on CBS. It was Paley's baby. He liked it. Uh, I don't think he liked me all that much, but he endured me because Goodson Todman, who owned the show, wanted me to do it. And it was fun because the entire organ, now this was five times a week for four or five years on CBS radio network. It later moved to television and it went three or four years in television, made a lot of money. It was, a, it was a half hour of the daytime schedule, be it radio or television or both. And the entire show consisted of the MC, that was a B, California, uh, consisted of the MC, in this case it was me, an announcer, Tony Marvin, and you can't get any higher or lower, as the case may be, voice-wise than Tony. It consisted of Mark Goodson and Bill Todman, who took turns producing. Bill would produce one day, Mark would produce the next day. It consisted of Mark's wife at the time, Bluma, who was the prize acquirer. And it consisted of two fine girls, uh, named Jeannie McCarthy and Barbara Olson. God, how memory serves when it goes back that far. In any event, that was the entire show. These girls uh, doubled as secretaries during office hours and worked as production assistants during showtime. Mark or Bill produced, I did the show, and Tony Marvin signed it on and off. And that was the entire show. I imagine our total budget all of us, my salary, the announcer's salary, the girls, the prize people, the prizes and everything, I'm willing to bet, and if, if I'm wrong, Goodson Todman owes me money, but I'm willing to bet the entire cost of that show was less than 3,000 bucks a week. Now today, today you can't, I don't think today you can get a pause for less than $6,000 a week, but I mean, that's, that's the whole thing, and although as many people didn't watch it or listen to it, it was only because they didn't have sets, they had as much fun. I think, I hope. I find myself at a loss. Am I clear here? I want to try to stand.
Bill, what would the game show of the future be about? By golly, that's a great question. And if I knew the answer to that, I doubt if I'd tell you right now, because I'd get in the packaging business. I'd, I'd run one up and move over to a, any network, go to any network and say, here's the game show of the future. I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that the game show of the future is going to be pretty much the same as today's game shows as far as content. There are only so many questions or, or challenges or, or tasks you can give your contestants. That'll be for the money. I think the MCs will all be younger and handsomer, much to my dismay. But I think the prizes will get out of hand. I, I have a feeling that, that the sets will be elaborate. The winners will perhaps be given totally tax-free rich man's lives for their and their next generation's heirs. I think the losers will be probably put to death or something commensurate with, with winners. I mean, I have a feeling that the, the next, the future game show, if nothing else, is going to perhaps make a lot of people rich and bring this world of ours to an end. <laughs> God said it would be a flatter fire. Wrong, God. It's game show is going to do it to you. You worry about that. <laughs> question about being a panelist and MC. No. Okay. Yeah, no, that's uh, right. Well, yeah, you've, you've been on both sides now. You've done. You've been a panelist and an MC. Uh, uh, would you tell us uh, what the difference is between those two worlds? Well, being an MC of a show, uh, a game show, is not a difficult thing, except for a few things. You have to get the show off on time. You have to ask the questions or pose the problems that are necessary and make sure that right answers are recorded right. And you have to make sure the sun stays out. Stop rolling. Okay, same question. Well, I guess the big difference is being the MC, there's, the pressure is on you. It's, it's on you to get the show off to keep things running smoothly and, and you stand or fall by it. Being a guest celebrity on any of these shows is seeing the sun go down. Stop the papers rolling. I guess we the... We were talking about the, the difference between being a panelist... Wait a minute, did we get speed? Yeah, yeah. you're okay. okay. Being so. a panelist and an MC. Well, the big difference is that being a panelist, the responsibility is on you to run the show, get it off on time and stuff like that. So there's pressure there. Being a celebrity guest to uh, or a panelist on a show is marvelous because you... Again. I, I, I got you off the wrong start. We should uh, use the words, what, celebrity... Celebrity guest or MC. MC. Mm -hmm. I'll start it again. Being an MC, the pressure is on you because you're responsible for the mechanics of the show. Being a celebrity guest is marvelous because you go in, you play a game, you do the best you can, you have a ball of fun, and you get paid good money for it. The only reason I'm not a permanent uh, celebrity guest is because there aren't enough shows around to give me that kind of work. So thereby, I'm still available as MC. I'll take the pressure and the money. But there is a big difference. Okay. Left you 40 seconds. Just check it. <laughs> hey, that's sensational. I've never been my own. Hey, Ron, how much did it get me back in the RTDG? I told him I, I told him I resigned from that. I should have stayed with it. Let's see. Put okay. this in your belt. All right. In your pocket. So, right. so you don't pull on the small right. cable. Okay. Let's see how much cable you have. Walk away. Let's I'll go until I run out. Not much. Not much. I'll go until we run out, and then I'll show them the rest of the place, and I'll do voiceover. Why don't you stand up against that All wall right. there? All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Boy, this is sensational. That's it cable wise. No, we're going to get some more. Oh, it's good. Not cable -wise. <laughs> <laughs> Shot of the crew? Shot of the crew. Oh, yeah, got to get the crew. Oh, yeah, that's. Hey, we're a very big deal. Listen, listen, you know what you were telling me? Like uh, the writers that you, Sid Caesar used to have, Neil Simon, uh, Woody Allen, or who knows, you know, in here is going to be some. Mega talent. Yeah. Let me do this way, buddy. All right. Okay, I'm going to extend you. Okay, that's good. See, now you can... Boy. That's the point. Well, listen, Ann, think of something, because, you know, you're the no, one... No, I just like the view. You okay. Know, That's super, yeah. You just dress that. Yeah, you send it back to Mother. That's another 20, 10 feet. Yeah, that's not bad. Okay.
You're gonna start there and come around to us, huh? Well, we'll do whatever you want. Okay, Bill. start the start with the fellows casually and come around to us, and I'll do a few brief words. Does the guild know you're doing this? Oh yeah. If oh, they don't, do. if they don't, they will. Okay. Now, <laughs> now, what do you want me to do? Start over there and uh, start from that position, I guess, and come around there slowly and find us. Start from that position. Yeah. And come come around and the right pan to us. Well, you want me to get you in focus? Okay. First, you want to focus. Okay. I'll right. focus on the sharpest thing I can see. There it is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> One belly button focus, that's it. Okay, we'll start back again. <coughs> we'll get the crew. This is the crew. This is the crew. Boy, look at that. Everybody getting a the shot there. Hey, we can call this, uh, let's call this. <laughs> You're working? Is this a take? You're on. Oh my goodness, it is a take. <laughs> Hi there, you probably wonder what we're doing. This is Ann Cullen and her husband Bill here at 2736 Cassiano Road in Bel Air in California. And you see the, the fine crew from ABC has been here doing a little spot. A lot of historic things have been here. The, the past president of Teledyne killed himself in that room right there. Things of which we're proud. ABC is up here to shoot us. Actually, the reason we're showing you this is one day we just bought this house, and we know how real estate goes up, and one day we're going to sell, right? Right. And we're going to send this to the real estate yes. people. That's sensational. Now, if you pardon me, if you take a look over there, and perhaps uh, pan left, uh, would you kind of get out of the road there, please, out of the way? There's our view of the mountains, you see prospective buyers would be most interested in that. Going on left, you come to some of the lower priced houses of the neighborhood. <laughs> and of course, directly, if, uh, if all you folks in the audience will just follow us, uh, walk this way. <laughs> That's the line. <laughs> walk this way, uh, Anne's way more than mine. Actually, I don't limp, it's the cable is caught in the thing. Yes. This is a, about as long a shot as you get of our backyard here. This is all Mexican tile. It's stolen in 1971 and put in here at little or no expense. And our pool, and if you, oh yes, would you mind, could you take a good shot of the house as long as you want, because that's a real tile roof, and uh, that's about it. It got plaster instead of, yeah, <laughs> plaster instead of board. But anyway, that's the, that's the property thing. Come over here, I guess we'll get a better shot of the, of the San Gabriels from here. Ann, would you like to say something? No. Good, good. Thank you, man. And oh yeah, we'll come over here a little further. I am deeply appreciative to all of you. No, he's all right. He still has, he's got his own, he's got his own power. <laughs> if you fall in the pool, I'm coming in and save the camera. There we go. Now, let's see. If you come over here, you can see what some rich guy across the way is building there. And perhaps see a little bit of the mountains, too. Could you do the pan there, the San Gabriels, and a fellow building a house there. That's three acres. And we don't know what he has in it, but we know he's going to pay a bundle before that's over. That's a pretty good, yeah, that's about it. We'll come down here and show them the remaining part of our, of our estate. <laughs> I think um, that's as far as I can go. That's as far as you can if, talk. If, uh, if video can go down here and take a shot of Ann. Come on, video. Call me Neil, please. Neil. Person, <laughs> Neil. Feelings. Neil, video. Neil. Lift your left leg, Neil. Good, you're over it. There goes Neil. Oh, I see. This is going to the, to the, uh, the recorder. Huh? And there's Ann showing you the, uh, that's the side, uh, that's the other side of our property. That's the side that's finished. Down there's the bird bath and the garbage cans and stuff like that. That yellow thing, and then there's the pool. And that great bunch of guys. And I think that's sensational, and I thank you very much for that. Anytime you want to, you got the tape in there, you shoot what you want, Neil. From here on in, Neil has it, and this is Bill Cullen leaving the business. No, huh? no. Don't you want to shut? No. Would you take off your clothes and go in the pool? No, you. <laughs> Boy, thank God for these clouds today, huh? Now, the nice thing about moving in here, we moved in in October, and we didn't know what was what. I'm like, that's, that's uh, Hawthorne. And all of a sudden, in like March, it comes up beautiful pink, and we didn't know it. And then the azaleas came, but we all didn't know that. All the yeah. surprises, we're still getting them. Yeah, it's just marvelous. Any okay. suggestions for the construction over there? <laughs> I'm dying to know what it's going to look like. Yeah, that, I told him that guy put, he has a million bucks in that lot. And we're dying to know what the house is going to look like. We hope it'll be something fun to look at, you know. And we hope he doesn't have loud parties because you can hear every noise. Well, I hope he has a tennis court on this side so I don't have so far to walk. <laughs> the guy next door owns a radio station. It must be a rock and roll station. But every three times a week he brings a tape up. 
and auditions it out in the back, you know, and it was rock and roll going like that. Beautiful. Did you get a picture looking this way? Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, I think you did. You got that, yeah. Neil? Do you want to yeah. sign off your uh, tape? Now? Okay. Thank you, gang, very much, dude. You're a hell of a man. <laughs> Thank you very kindly. And that's the color of the state, and you can have it for a song. Before you go, a few more words about name that tune. <laughs> How'd you get that question? Oh, I was just in there. <laughs> no, yeah, who put it in? Someone knew something. Yeah, Pat. Yeah, I must have, I must have oh, bared my soul one day to Pat. That's probably what I did. As soon as you asked it, I thought, oh, God, someone gave it. You had the wrong show. No, no. How in the no. world could anyone think of that Thank you. show? <laughs> well, we should know. I, mean, I was telling Ron, I, you know, she just mentioned that show was on, I think, Tuesday night. Nice to start getting sick on Monday. Just think. <laughs> well, we have the we, same we thing with Ronald Barry. We know this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. You know, it's a lack of class. No, I'm kidding. It means people, you know. I still like when you told me, don't say you're sorry. Which is very good because I'd rather not be put in a position of refusing. But I wouldn't want to be on that show. Okay. I don't think they want any more of me. I think they've had enough of me. Okay, stop, okay, stop tape. <laughs>